Hey folks, uh, this video is part three of a series on civilization, so you might want to watch the other two on this playlist in order before you watch this one. If you've seen them, great. If not, whatever. Let's talk about this West we've heard so much about. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Ever since I've been paying attention to political attitudes, I've heard people talk about the West or Western civilization. On the one hand, you could say it's obvious the West exists. <clears throat> it's the distinctive civilization that came out of Europe, especially Western Europe, which spread its political model of the nation-state around the world with the spread of European empires. Nowadays, it includes Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand, so ironically, the West is not located in any one part of the world. It might also include places like Israel, South Africa, Latin America, depending how people define it. Surely all these different places have distinct cultures and subcultures, but maybe there are some things that unite them? Along with this territorial definition or lack of definition, people ascribe certain values to the West. And that's what we're going to talk about here. After all, when people who identify as Westerners talk about the West, they're usually talking about shared cultural values that sound really noble. We've been brought up to think all these places we call the West hold certain timeless values that unite them and truly define this civilization. So what are these values? I've been told democracy, the rule of law, human rights, freedom itself, and rationality and logic are some of the West's core values. Let's look a little closer. First, we need to know, should we call things Western just because they come from Europe? If so, we also need to know, do they really come from Europe? Well, only if we ignore the essential contributions of Arab, Indian, Chinese, and African thinkers and scientists. We credit ancient Romans and Greeks with creating the wonderful West and never acknowledge the foreign influences on their empires. We don't even acknowledge the foreign influences on modern European empires. But without foreign influences, there would be no West. Again, democracy. We talk about ancient Greece as if Athens were the same kind of state as the US or the UK today. And hardly any Americans seem to know, the Iroquois Confederation was a much bigger inspiration for the Constitution they claim to believe in. All the things we think of as Western have come from or been irrevocably changed by non-European cultures. Indeed, considering the Romans and Greeks as the starting point of the so-called West is an arbitrary choice. It reflects the attitudes of modern European philosophers and historians, not some ironclad truth about a primordial civilization with an unbroken history. And none of the ideas taken from ancient Roman Greek, uh, Greece would ever have come back to Europe if not for Muslims and Arabs and Indians making huge strides in philosophy and science, translating the works of old, and then sending them back to Europe. I've been thinking recently that the only thing that could legitimately be called a Western value is talking about your supposed civilization's <clears throat> supposedly noble values and not actually living them. Look at democracy. I've been told all my life that democracy is the best system of government and, and that it comes from ancient Greece. I made a whole series of videos on democracy you might want to watch. Suffice it to say, what we call democracy today is just a system of elite rule where some people get a feeling that they're in charge because they got to vote. 
which sometimes leads them to blame themselves or other voters for everything that goes wrong. Democracy is mostly built on a lie. But even to the extent that it exists, where competitive elections exist, it's hard to say to what extent it's actually a value. If people really valued democracy, wouldn't they push harder against the daily anti-democratic uses of power against them and people in other countries? There are people in all societies that have been called Western who reject democracy, some out of apathy, some on the libertarian left, like me, because it's not the system of freedom and justice that it pretends to be, or on the authoritarian right, with people who are just fine with dictatorship. People who support U.S. foreign policy often style themselves as Democrats because they believe the rhetoric of converting foreign states to democracies. But they couldn't possibly believe in real democracy because U.S. foreign policy creates dictatorships, not democracies. No state the U.S. has occupied or supported other than Germany and Japan has ever become a democracy because of U.S. involvement. A lot of people who support U.S. foreign policy are well aware of that fact, and they're fine with dictatorship because other people can't be trusted with democracy or they're not ready for it yet. So everyone loves to talk about democracy, but in practice, most people don't believe in it. Same goes for human rights. Everyone believes in human rights in the abstract. If you just talk vaguely about human rights, hardly anyone will tell you you shouldn't believe in them. But they can always find exceptions. Sure, there's a centuries-old legal tradition of letting people have a fair trial if they're suspected of a crime, but these people are terrorists! Sure, the same legal tradition says you can't hold someone for more than 24 hours without charging them with something. But these people cross the border without asking! So human rights are more of a suggestion that can be abandoned whenever one's prejudices get in the way. The rule of law applies to me, but can be suspended in a crisis. And there's always a crisis. Freedom is important for me. But for anyone who might not think the same way as me, it's fine to take away their freedom indefinitely. Speaking of freedom, you know someone doesn't believe in freedom because they talk about how people that they don't know, like so-called illegal immigrants, as if they didn't deserve any freedom at all. These are the same people who push for tougher prisons and prison sentences who say nothing about reports of torture in U.S. jails except those people probably deserved it. If you value freedom for yourself, but not for others, you don't really value freedom. So these values that we think of as part of the core of a civilization that's real are more rhetorical than anything we actually believe in. It's considered perfectly normal for states to say they uphold human rights and justice and so on while continually violating them, or turning a blind eye to violations of them. The whole political system requires them to talk that way, so the rest of us believe the system exists to uphold human rights and so on, and that it's just currently gone astray. It's also quite common for fascists to say they believe in these ideals for rhetorical purposes and then outright reject them in practice. But because these voices are so loud, because they're so easy to find, it's common for people who aren't authoritarians and right-wing liars to be affected by these words. We just like the sound of the words. They invoke both ideals we're supposed to believe in, and the belief that our civilization is superior. I think it's pretty clear, empty rhetoric for the purpose of making people feel better about their chosen identities is highly valued here. Look how 
right-wing Americans say the U.S. is not racist or hardly racist, that racism is purely confined to the margins, that the president isn't racist. Or, like Dennis Prager says, based on nothing at all, America has become the least racist multiracial society in world history. Why would someone say a statement like that so obviously divorced from reality? Well, it makes conservatives feel good and gives them a talking point to throw back at anyone who calls them out for their racism or anyone who points out the U.S. is a white supremacist state and always has been. They just refuse to admit there might be more to their country under the surface. These Western values are supposed to have grown out of a philosophical tradition that includes some currently popular European philosophers, though certainly not all of them. The problem is, even the ones we select to represent the West, we don't really follow the philosophy that they set out. And if you don't apply philosophy in any way, it's not your philosophy. These philosophers are thought of as having nice ideas and so on, but when it comes to time to put things into practice, there's usually no resemblance to anything they said. Jean-Jacques Rousseau gets credit for the design of the first French Republic, but neither that state nor any subsequent ones actually followed his ideas. In fact, you'd need to look pretty far to find any policies, anything the state or the capitalist class does, that uses philosophy as a guide. They occasionally use it as an excuse to do what they were going to do anyway. But I see no reason to consider any philosophy the basis of any society considered the West. And yet every year, another book comes out about how noble Western values are, and how we should give ourselves a big pat on the back. I'll leave one or two links in the description as an example. Um, I'll, I'm not going to debunk everything point by point, especially when others have done it uh, better than I could. All I'll say is, if there's no connection between theory and practice, how is your civilization built on philosophy at all? Philosophy should be used to explain and question the world, but it often just gets used to justify it. Since those values are invoked hardest when going to war, I'm pretty sure the real values are believing empty words and not caring what they're used for. No wonder I don't fit in. Another major blind spot people who talk about the West seem to forget is the wealth of this West was built on the exploitation of slaves and colonized people around the world. People don't like to talk about the iffy parts of their past. They just want to talk about all the awesome inventions Westerners created. That said, over history, what the West is has changed. And most importantly, how we think about it changes all the time. It changes when we talk about it. So the image of what the West is has always been in flux. Uh, let's read an excerpt from this article by Daniel Walden in Current Affairs. What I mean to expose here is that there is no stable Western tradition at all. There were other concepts that encompassed Europe, like the medieval and early modern idea of Christendom, but Christendom was badly damaged by the wars of religion and was thoroughly dead after the French Revolution, and in any case, Christendom is a very different thing from the West. The latter is a modern invention, taken up by some college elite professors, and then sold door-to-door -door for a tidy profit. The right, particularly the respectable right, is very keen to claim that it remains faithful to some cultural inheritance 
that the left has abandoned in favor of contemporary fashionable orthodoxies, but they play the same game that we do. They're just better at selling it. The harm in buying into the right's framing of a venerable and antiquated Western tradition goes beyond uh, being mocked by classicists in academic footnotes. Accepting their terms means accepting implicitly that there is a tradition of thought with enough internal coherence that one can decide what falls in it and what doesn't. Maybe we should abandon that idea altogether. There's a link in the description. I recommend reading it after this. You can also get an idea of how this image has changed, if you want, by looking at the history of Orientalism. Orientalist art and scholarship over a couple of hundred years have created not only how we see Arabs, Muslims, and the that quote-unquote that whole area over there, but also how we see ourselves by contrast. But it's not just Orientalism. Seeing Africa as the other, and seeing the Americas as the other, has shaped the West's self-image just as much. Europeans would talk about the people of the Orient, or the Dark Continent, or the colonies, as if they were, well, barbarians. So eventually, it got taken for granted. The current main enemy people want us to believe is the evil Muslim. So when people talk about Muslims, whether or not they talk about the West, they're recreating their self-image and recreating what the West is. Now, I've maintained so far the reason we say these things about the West is so people who are considered Westerners can feel good about themselves. But I also think it's about the security of having symbols to cling to. People like symbols. In fact, they like symbols more than they like the things they symbolize. Because symbols can be perfect. But the thing the symbol represents can look ugly if you really examine it. Words are symbols, especially words that have broad meanings like freedom and democracy. They're never defined and then measured against the way things really work. They're just used to reinforce the feeling of patriotism. People love words that they hear repeatedly used to define and advertise their culture. They're all part of the safety blanket of culture and faith. That blanket includes a love of flags and presidents and historical moments they choose to be defining. And why do you think there are so many statues to soldiers all over the place? All these things make up the country, as in the phrase, I love my country. But usually people who are really proud of the symbolic country or civilization don't know much actual history, and don't know how much of what they think is wrong. But why study history? I have my symbols. That's all I need to know. So when you hear about Western values, you know people are talking about symbols, not the much more complex idea those symbols are supposed to represent. So what the West is, geographically, historically, philosophically, it's just not clear. It's not a solid object you can point to and study scientifically. And everything I've talked about to today, from values to defining moments in history to where the West is, has changed over time. I would say the West is basically a poorly defined idea. We create it by talking about it. And we create it by talking about other civilizations using our impressions of what things are like there to compare and contrast. Fuzzy concepts like civilization and the West are useful for making sweeping generalizations, which sometimes serve the people in power who create enemies for the masses to hate. But they're not very useful for learning.
when we refuse to listen and refuse to learn and let someone become the other, they become the enemy. Belief in the enemy manifests itself at present as intimidating people, maybe by yelling at them or harassing them in the street, or vandalizing homes and places of worship, or in encouraging wars or border violence against them, or in movements that elect racist and fascist politicians, or outright murder, as in the many of the cases we've heard about, about young white men shooting a dozen people in a mosque, or whatever it was this week. These guys leave manifestos talking about how they have to protect Western civilization from Muslims and maybe Jews, blacks, immigrants, whoever they've learned to fear. And their manifestos cite all the right-wing YouTubers and writers they've been getting their information from. So our problem has causes. We have to fight this. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Next, next week, we'll be deconstructing the non-existent enemy of the non-existent West. The Muslim world. Ooh. See you then.